The sinking of Henry VIII's mighty warship, the Mary Rose, remains one of our greatest maritime mysteries. What happened on that ill-fated day in 1545 has puzzled historians and archaeologists for centuries. Now, scientists investigating the skeletons have uncovered new evidence about the crew. Their most startling find offers a completely original explanation of why the Mary Rose sank. It's a time capsule. These people are lying there, often clothed in what they were wearing, carrying the equipment they would have carried with their personal possessions with them. And you can't help but look at these people, firstly sense the tragedy, and then secondly wonder who they were. How did they come to be there? What, what were they doing on board um, when they met their deaths there? In the early 1980s, I volunteered as a diver on the Mary Rose. Today, I'm an intensive care doctor and carry out research at University College London. My later research has focused on how bones change with exercise and with injury patterns. And you can actually learn a lot about a person from the way their skeleton is. So that's my passion now, is to take that knowledge back 20 odd years to see if we can't work out who these people were. I was one of 500 divers working on the Mary Rose. It was one of the largest underwater excavations ever undertaken. we found amazing objects. Longbows, bronze cannon, and alongside these weapons of war, more personal possessions. The excavation caused a sensation. The Mary Rose was Britain's Pompeii, a moment of life frozen in time. Up to now, attention has focused on these objects. But what both fascinated and appalled the divers were the human remains. There were a number of ribs and a leather jerkin. And that really brought it home to me, you know, this was part of the person's clothing, you know, this, this you know, it was, it really came alive to me. One of the guns was lifted. That's right, there was and a body trapped, absolutely underneath. trapped underneath it. That's and right. And you I think remember. you realise how that person died. He was caught with his arms beneath, wasn't he? Yeah. And, and you, you imagined this poor fellow trapped under this probably a ton of bronze in his last moments trying to shift it. And of course, they can't have thought when they set out that that was mm, what the day happen. held for them. The divers recovered nearly 10,000 human bones from the Mary Rose. But we had little idea who these people were. Since diving on the wreck, I've been haunted by the fate of these men, and I've always wanted to know what happened. The historical records are very limited. We know the Mary Rose was 34 years old and one of Henry VIII's most heavily armed warships. She carried a crew of over 400 men, but we don't know who most of them were or where they came from. We only know for sure the identity of one person on board that day, the Admiral, George Carew. In the summer of 1545, Carew sailed the Mary Rose out of Portsmouth Harbour to engage an invading French fleet. He fired a broadside at the enemy, then a few minutes later had to make a quick manoeuvre to avoid running aground. During this move, in calm seas, the ship took on water, keeled over and sank. The reason for this disaster has always puzzled me.
I've come back to Portsmouth to investigate further the horrors of that summer's day. Is it true? I mean, it was said that Henry VIII could hear the screams of the drowning sailors. Absolutely. Across, across the water, the sound travels over there. It is literally just a mile over to Southsea Castle. When she sank, the masts, oh, yeah, there we go. the main mast and the foremast were up above the surface of the water oh, here. At this point, she sank. This is the boy marking the site where she sank. So there's Henry VIII standing there, watching the pride of his fleet sink to the bottom. Yep. The death toll on the Merry Rose was horrendous. Anti-boarding netting covered the upper deck. It was coated in tar and sand to make it difficult for enemy boarders to cut through. But when the vessel sank, it trapped nearly everyone inside. Almost the entire crew of around 400 men died. So what was happening on the Mary Rose in the moments before she sank? You've got a very concentrated time period with an awful lot of action going on. A lot of noise, the guns going off, the French attacking, everything in chaos. She may have been making that turn too tightly, possibly with too much sail set. So some disorganisation on board. Sir George Carew was uh, shouting uh, across to one of the other English ships that he had the sort of knaves that he could not rule. Knaves whom he could not rule. The last reported words from the Admiral on board the Mary Rose appear to blame the crew. So were the men responsible for their own fate? The Mary Rose Trust has allowed us to carry out an exhaustive scientific investigation of the crew found in the wreck. We've examined some of the skeletons in detail, including one who may have played a critical role in the sinking. When we set out, I had no idea that this forensic detective work would lead to a startling conclusion about why the Mary Rose sank. In 1982, after removing the contents of the ship, the Mary Rose Trust raised her to the surface. There is the first sight of this flagship of Henry VIII. It's the first time we have seen this in 437 years. What an amazing sight. This oak hull had been a giant coffin for most of the men of the Mary Rose. I'd always been intrigued by the Admiral's harsh description of the crew as knaves whom he could not control. Had they somehow contributed to the sinking of the ship? To help lay their ghosts to rest, I'm determined to find out more about the crew. I've returned to the ship, shrouded in its preservative mist, to find out who would have been where and doing what at the time of the sinking. Look at that. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Last time I got this close, I was probably about in there somewhere. Yeah, you remember, I mean, this is diving on the hold here, but yeah. we never saw it like this. No, no, I mean, of course, the visibility was absolutely shocking. I still find it hard to imagine how 400 men crammed into this small ship. But we know they did. This illustration, completed the year after the ship sank, gives a breakdown of the crew. 185 soldiers, which would have included archers, 200 mariners and 30 gunners, who looked after the heavy cannon on board. In time of battle, the soldiers and archers would have been on the top deck. Many of the gunners would have been manning the big guns on the deck below. Where did you find the bodies? I mean, were they where you expected to find them? Presumably archers would have been on the top deck ready to shoot the French. Yes, I mean, they would mainly have been on the, on the top decks, but we did find items of archery equipment all round the ship, and we found human remains all round the ship. 
So what you can't do is say that everybody that was found on the upper deck was an archer or that all the archers were found on the upper deck. You know, there is a bit more of a mixture. The mixture of skeletons is going to make this a much harder puzzle to crack. To find out more calls for a scientific study of the remains. I want to see if it's possible to examine the skeletons and work out what jobs they did. Is there any way we can separate the archers from the sailors and the sailors from the gunners? I received a number of huge boxes and these were full of bones and they were in nets, right, as they were found. So it was a complete jigsaw. The job of solving one of the biggest forensic puzzles underwater archaeologists had ever undertaken fell to osteoarchaeologist Anne Sterland. Because of the mix of bones, no one knew exactly how many bodies there were. And clearly, I mean, we found some skeletons where they were almost intact, sometimes with clothing on and their materials, but in many other cases you had pieces of, yes. uh, of body. Yes. All jumbled up. All right. So how on earth do you start assembling a person from, a, from mass of bones like this? Well, we started with pairs um, because we are bilaterally symmetrical. So we've got okay. two thigh bones, two shin bones, two arm bones, etc. Mm. So we started by matching or trying to match um, bones that we recognise. So there is a pair of thigh bones and if you look, you can see that they go together quite well if you look at the bones. You mm. have to look at them very carefully but you can see that they match. Mm, yeah. So they, they belong to that. And yeah. then we looked at the tibia, the chin bone. Yeah. So it's really some matching to build them together yes, in terms of can... proportion and symmetry. That's right. Then we looked at the pelvis, um, because we can fit the femur into the pelvis. And this yeah. is a right. So that goes in there like that. Right. And you work your way up. up we work our way up. So you way. then start and build up the vertebra. Anne set to work sorting the bones into individual skeletons. From the thousands of bones, it turned out we had the remains of 197 individuals. But only 92 were complete enough to be reconstructed. From these 92, I've selected three skeletons for further scientific investigation. Each has unique pathology that provides vital clues about who they were. And one of them, the shortest of the three, may have contributed to the demise of the ship. The first skeleton was found in the bow of the ship, in an area used as a store. It's that of a man who was six feet tall. To try to find out what he and the other two men looked like, I've sent their skulls to medical artist Richard Neve. His drawings of forensically reconstructed faces have helped the police solve crimes. The first challenge is to put flesh on the skull. He uses modern measurements of flesh thickness collected from living people using ultrasound. I'm attaching these small wax pegs lightly to the surface of the skull, and they indicate the average thickness of soft tissue at these particular anatomical points. The measurements are based on a series of white individuals between the ages of 20 and 29, and they will help to guide the amount of flesh, if you like, that is laid over the surface of the skull. The pegs provide critical markers to enable Richard to construct a 3D map of the face. What I first have to establish is the width of the nose and the position and width of the mouth. Putting an eye in place fairly quickly, put the other eye in. Sketching by hand, produces a likeness with far more character than a computer-generated reconstruction. So we take the skull away now. Mm. 
He was a, a very powerfully built man. Massive muscle insertions in the base of the skull and down the side of his face here, the big uh, temporalis and masseter muscles for chewing. Quite clear, he was a big, powerful, solid kind of a guy. Great for the front row of the forward, something like that in rugby. That kind of heavy, heavy, beefy kind of guy. This description of a big, muscular man could fit most of the crew. To help find out what this man did on the ship, I've sought the advice of osteoarchaeologist Rose Drew. She has studied ancient skeletons from around the world. OK, so this is a big guy yes. um, in the prime of life. Any clues, then, as to what this man did for a living? Offhand, I'd say the most striking wear was done on his shoulders. With his shoulder blades, this thing here is called the acromion. Mm -hmm. And your, your clavicle, your collarbone, travels from the sternum to the acromion. Well, the acromion is missing its tip. Bones fuse as you age. And the tip fuses on after you're 16, 17, like that. There's the tip. Mm. And you can see it's got that kind of a bubbly appearance. Yeah. So that it was fused in life, but only with soft tissue. And what stopped this joining, as it should have done? Well, I think it kept moving when it should have not been moving. Ah. It was strained. It was stressed, actually. So this was way. a lot of repeated load on this. Well, whatever he was doing, it was very strenuous to his shoulder area. This rare disorder is known as os acromiale. So what could cause this man's shoulder blades to be in two parts? In children, the tip of the shoulder blade is joined to the main part by a piece of soft cartilage. This allows the shoulder joint to expand as we grow. When we become adults, this cartilage fuses and becomes solid bone. But in our skeleton, this never happened, and the shoulder blade remained in two pieces. Osochromiali can be caused by repeated and heavy loading on the shoulders, and our man wasn't the only person on the ship to have it. 24 other shoulder blades were found with the same condition. So what job on the Mary Rose could cause this to happen? Climbing the rigging looks like one possibility. Sailors would use their arms to support themselves. But the loads don't look great enough. They'd take most of their weight on their legs. So if our man is not a sailor, what other job would fit the evidence? One of the most surprising finds on the Mary Rose was the huge number of longbows and arrows. 172 bows and over 4,000 arrows. Many of the soldiers on board must have been archers. Could our man be one of them? Pulling a heavy bow requires a lot of strength. It's just the sort of activity that could cause this disorder. The only problem is that modern archers don't appear to suffer from this condition. But perhaps pulling a Tudor war bow put more strain on the shoulder. Steve Stratton is a bowyer. He's gone to great lengths to make an exact replica of a bow from the Mary Rose. Most people believe that the yew trees in this country were used for making bows. Well, they were, but not for something, uh, a powerful war bow. Henry VIII wanted the best weapons for his archers, and that meant importing the right type of wood from Europe. Most of it would have been Mediterranean, a mountain view above 3,000 metres altitude. And that is what you want for a very good bow. Massive power in it. This test measures the force needed to pull this replica Tudor bow. Its draw weight is a massive 170 pounds, over three times the weight of a modern Olympic bow. So could pulling war bows like this cause the shoulder injury we see in the Mary Rose skeletons? Only a handful of people today have the strength and technique to pull these bows. 
Mark Stretton is one of them. You're actually physically drawing 170 pounds. Um, you, you know, that, that's like picking up a 16 stone person with your fingertips. Mark holds the Guinness World Record for pulling the strongest bow. But the record came at a price. Over the last two years, I've started to have problems with my left shoulder, which is largely down to the huge compressive forces that's been inflicted by the bow. So could Mark be suffering from the same condition as our Mary Rose skeleton? Can I shake that hand? Yeah. You're suffering, <laughs> are you? Yeah, well, on this one. That that's, one. that's OK. To check this theory, I'm putting Mark through an MRI machine to see if his shoulder bone is in two sections. Slice by slice, the magnetic resonance imaging machine builds up a picture of Mark's shoulder. This looks very much uh, like a repetitive type of injury pattern rather than one particularly big injury mark. It, it's... Barris Adad is a leading orthopaedic surgeon. From the scan, he can tell if Mark has os acromiali. And you can see this is a sort of relatively uh, worn joint here but having a problem in that little joint on top of the shoulder is something that's uh, easily solved. So I'm not ready for the scrap heap just yet, then? No, no, I think you've got a way to go. So, Faris, you've, I mean, you've looked at Mark's shoulder with this magnetic resonance scan. Has he got osacromiali, as our archers, we think, had? He, he doesn't have osacromiali, but he has pathology in, in the same area. And so you could say that he's got a problem in that exact same region, but he doesn't have osacromiali, which typically is a sort of problem that would have developed in childhood. It's a failure of a growth plate to fuse. So the now, difference here, we, we might hypothesise, is that Marx started loading the skeleton when that had already fused, but if he'd started doing this when he was six or seven or eight, that actually maybe... We could hypothesise, and this, it's only a hypothesis, but sure. we could say that if you do this sort of thing at a young age, rather than getting the damage that you've got in the joint, you're, you've got failure of the growth plates to heal properly. In Henry VIII's time, the longbow, with its armour-piercing power, was still a key part of Britain's defence. But it was only as good as the men drawing the bows. To guarantee an army of powerful archers, English law required male children to practise archery every week. When young archers drew a heavy war bow, the tip of the shoulder blade would be constantly pushed or pulled. It would never stay still long enough to fuse into bone and would remain in two pieces. From the evidence, our first skeleton is almost certainly that of a Tudor archer. The position of his body in the hold suggests he was collecting supplies when the ship sank. Down here, he had no chance of escape. But what about our other two skeletons? The bones of our second man suggest an unusually brutal life on board the Mary Rose, while our third man might have been one of those responsible for failing to save the ship. Trapped deep in the hold of the Mary Rose in the galley, the ship's kitchen, divers found the skeleton of a man about five foot four inches tall. He was discovered with one of his shoes still intact, a knife handle and a comb. His body lay among scattered bricks, all that was left of the ship's oven. If he lived and died where he was found, he could have been a cook. And if he was a cook, then we may even have his name. One of the wooden eating bowls recovered from the Mary Rose is carved with the words, Nye Cop, cook. Could this have belonged to our skeleton?
Could these be the remains of Nykop? What does medical artist Richard Neve think he looked like? Our second chap, well, he was a young man, 20 something, and by all appearances, he was very healthy, very strong. He would have had this kind of youthful appearance, unless there's been some dreadful period in their life where they've been malnourished and, and so on and so forth. The ravages of time haven't taken their toll. What do the bones tell us about? I was keen to learn what osteoarchaeologist Rose Drew would make of this younger man. Did he have the physique of a cook? One of the first things that struck me when I, when I met him, if you will, mm. was that he had ripped both um, kneecaps rather dramatically um, well before he died because they'd healed as best they could. But the ligaments that would cover, that would go from the tibia, the shin bone, yeah. on up here, are just ripped and torn. They're even away from the body of the bone. Yeah. So, so whatever he did, he did it at the same time with an equal strain to both legs. This is osteoarthritis. He's got evidence here that he was doing too much lifting when he was younger on his vertebrae. So these are backbones again That's here. the backbones. So he's wearing himself out, really, this guy. Oh, he really is. And this, the collarbone, the ligament underneath that attaches it to the breastbone yeah. is, again, it's heavily um, eroded. Yeah. It's just a big gaping hole. That's the ligament that's been deeply strained. Goodness gracious. So, yeah. I mean, this bloke would have been suffering, presumably. I mean, he's already getting arthritis. He's going to be aches and pains quite a lot. Oh, seriously. Whatever he did was uh, very hard labor. This man has some terrible injuries for someone still in his 20s. Whatever he did, it was probably more physical than being a cook. To investigate further what his job might be, we put his bones through a CT scanner. From my own medical research, I know that exercise can alter the shape of bones. The X-ray slices of his upper arm bones can tell us how much he was using them. So as you go through, you can see that the bone shafts are actually uh, pretty thick. And this isn't disease that's making it thick. This is it's bone that's got thick because it was being stressed. It had grown to become strong. Yes, um, bone thickness will be... But Rose has noticed something else about his arm bones. These are very symmetrical and they're thick. Right, so this is, again, heavy loading both sides at once. Yes, whatever he was doing, he was doing it evenly on both arms. I really lean more toward heavy, heavy objects that are being lifted with both arms. Right pushed with both arms, handled with both arms equally. The symmetry of his arm bones provides a clue to his occupation. There was some thought that he might have been associated with the kitchen because he was found down in the hold near the kitchen area, has mm. these big cauldrons. And you would think that feeding a crew would be heavy duty work, sure. but I also think it would be very um, asymmetrical or unbalanced what you'd be doing. Chopping you'd be with chopping one with one hand. You, you would probably pick up heavy things with both arms, I'm sure, but you'd still do more with with one arm than the other, and his bones are really very even. So g g given what we know of this skeleton, any guesses as to what he might have been? What would you say he did? I would really want to say gunner, because of the heavy um, loads involved with doing the gunning. So potentially a gunner? P potentially a gunner, yes. If you want to find the nearest equivalent to a Mary Rose Gunner today, look no further than Colin Herriot. Camp homie cartridge. He's worked with Cannon for nearly half his life. He's fascinated by the power of these explosive weapons. In with the ball. Prick and prime. Give him fire. He knows how lethal they can be. Good shot. Smashed it. And if these splinters are the size of that, Jack, oh, massive. that's got to be a metre long or more jagged end. Take a man's head off. Right, forward. But the 71 big guns on board the Mary Rose were not just lethal to the enemy. Their weight made them extremely dangerous to the sailors drafted in to fire them. 
What are up? Working the guns when you were in action was, was a pretty hairy business. Lots of opportunity for injury and instant death. Okay, two, three. Eve. Two, hold it again. Two, three. We're good. Push. You've got a moving oh, depth yeah. and you've got sometimes a slippery depth. Every chance of, of injury, whatever you're doing, because it's heavy, heavy metal. You have to manfully lift the gun up on a couple of cross pikes, lift it up, put it in position. You've only got to put your foot wrong, snap. Cartilages, ligaments, all go. Colin has many of the injuries we see in our second skeleton. Well, I've been working with cannons 22 years now. Uh, I'm deaf, as I said, and I'm riddled with arthritis because of moving of the guns. That knee there is completely shot. And to be quite honest, at my age, if I was in Tudor times, they'd have buried me at sea long ago. Firing! Our sailor's injury is consistent with an accident lifting the heavy breech of one of the wrought iron guns. If the other end of the breech was dropped, his bent legs would suddenly take all the weight. The instant load would tear off his kneecaps. The injury would leave torn ligaments that would eventually turn to bone, just like those in our skeleton. This man's bones are consistent with him being a gunner for much of his time on the ship. But once injured, it's unlikely he performed the most physical work. Our first two skeletons were found in the hold. Our last skeleton was discovered in a location that places him at the centre of the action. The main deck of the Mary Rose contained the guns and the gun crews. 17 skeletons were found here. One of the most complete was the body of this man. He was shorter than average, but what makes him special is that he was found next to a bosun's call, a whistle used for issuing commands. It implies he was an officer, which means he may have played a critical part in the last moments of the ship. He may well have been the officer responsible for deploying cannons and for opening and shutting the gun ports. Water pouring in through these gun ports sank the ship. Why the crew failed to close them is at the heart of this mystery. Could the failure of command rest on this man's shoulders? Can his bones confirm that he was an officer? This individual is older than some of the other skeletons I've seen. Mm. What sort of age do we think he might have been? Oh, I think he was um, in his late 30s into his 40s. Uh, the things that would indicate to me that someone has achieved at least the age of 30, the way his, um, his collarbones are fused, but also his teeth. He's got bad teeth, which can happen at any age. There's a rotten stump, there's an abscess over here. The teeth are very worn down, and you can see dentin. Here is where the enamel has been worn away and mm. actually exposes the dentin. This man's age is consistent with him being someone in charge, but there's more of his life story etched in his bones. Here's his collarbone. Let's look at that one. That's the underneath part that would have attached to the breastbone. And you've got the collarbone from the young, younger fellow with the ripped kneecaps, right? And they're really very different. They're very they? different, aren't they? Um, so this one's got a great big sort of divot out of it, hasn't it? Yes, it does. The, the muscles, the ligaments, rather, pulling on this damaged the bone. You can see that. Mm. And on this one? It, it did at one time, but it's filled in. So it's healed? It's healed. It is healed. So this guy is still doing heavy manual labour that's continuing to injure the bone. This guy's done some manual labour in the past and he's now stopped. This guy's had a more sedentary life recently. Yes, he has. OK. What sort of job did this guy do then? He obviously wasn't a gunner or a w working on the rigging. Well, I don't think they had any totally useless people on the ship. Yeah. So um, if he wasn't the doctor um, or something like that, you would have to say he was perhaps in a supervisory position. The bones are consistent with a man who worked his way up through the ranks to the position of an officer. 
He was not a senior officer. They would have come from the aristocracy. He was almost certainly the ship's boatswain or master gunner. He was an older man, more mature than the others, um, but likely to be more experienced and possibly somebody to whom they turned when things went a little bit wrong. His face was a different shape, slightly more rounded, slightly more refined nose. And for a man, of course, who'd been at sea for most of his life, probably fresh air, wind, sun, all that would have worked on his face so that the creases around the nose and the mouth and the eyes and so on would be that much more heavily marked. Our man was found on the main deck. The gun ports here were close to the waterline, which made the ship extremely vulnerable. Did something under his control go wrong here that caused the ship to sink? Maritime archaeologist Alex Hildred has investigated the final moments of the Mary Rose. What happened to the ship rested on the actions of those on the gun deck. How close to the water would we have been? About just over a metre from, from the water Is that line all? here. That seems pretty dangerous to me. Well, it is, and that's probably why she sank. And that's another reason to suggest that when the ship healed, having yeah. fired around, you know, it's, it's entirely consistent with the fact water would have come through the gun ports and, and overwhelmed the ship. So and the gun port starts... lids were open, you know, they were found open and hinged against the back of the ship. So as soon as water starts trickling in, we've now You've got... had it. You're beginning to go over in a big way. And so the, the, the gun port lids would have been raised and lowered by some poor fellow standing above. And these were heavy? The, well, 55 kilos, 50 kilos, and pulling against a ship that's moving. It's quite a long way over, and having to pull this down at the behest of the master gunner when there's all sorts of noise happening with the only mm. communication being through a ventilation shaft there and that it's no wonder they didn't manage to shut the lids in the chaos of battle with all the shouting and guns going off it would have taken a very clear chain of command and a very disciplined well-rehearsed crew to close the gun port lids in time. So how closely knit was the crew of the Mary Rose? Were they a well-drilled team that had trained together? Or was there some problem in the chain of command? Forensic science is about to reveal a startling discovery that may rewrite the story of the Mary Rose. To pinpoint the geographical origins of our three crew members, we've sent the skulls to undergo an innovative test with forensic expert Lynn Bell. We're going to sample the enamel. Uh, so I'll show you, it's a very small sample, you can barely see it when we take it. Mm -hmm. So we uh, aim for the molars, yeah. and we just sample one. And what can you tell from that when you've analysed it? we can hope to regionalise that person. Ah, so you might be able to give us an idea of where these people came, came from. from. Yes. At Bradford University, Lynn's colleague, Professor Julia Lee Thorpe, extracts enamel from our three skeletons. The composition of our teeth varies according to where we lived as children. It depends on the type of water we consumed during the time our teeth were forming. Water molecules in clouds come in different forms. Some water molecules contain heavy atoms of oxygen, others light oxygen atoms. When it rains, the cloud releases more of the heavy type in warmer regions. This means the water in the soil varies slightly from place to place and these differences can be plotted on a map. The water in the soil is absorbed into the plants we eat and in growing children eventually finds its way into their teeth. Using a mass spectrometer, Julia and Lynn can determine roughly where our three men lived when they were young. 
first skeleton, we got a number of minus 5.5. So this is our potential archer? This it? is the potential archer. We look at 5.5. That puts him um, tightly into the British range. There's no doubt about him. Right. Could be southwest England or southwest Wales, isn't it? Is yes, that's not? right. And the next one? Oh, the boatswain. 4.6. 4.6. So quite different. Yeah. <laughs> Not much of it, is there? I mean, you no. sort of, you'd have to be right down here. I mean, it's very much on the edge. So, sort of southwest Ireland or really southwest England, Cornwall. Yes, Cornwall. And then. So, uh, this is our potential gunner. This is the gunner. Four and a half? 4.5. And this is an interesting value. Well, yeah, it's very we low compared we to. We don't this. really see a 4.5 on this map. Right, so he, he might not be a native Brit. He, he might may be... not be. Lynn has also analysed a larger sample of crew members. You, you've looked at 18 skeletons overall. How does that compare to the distribution of the other skeletons? Uh, well, it compares really well because of my, my sample of, of 18, potentially 60% of the crew wasn't British on that day. How extraordinary. And upwards of a half of the crew of Mary Rose might not have been native Brits. Well, a third to two thirds, actually. It was a huge surprise to me. I was expecting them all to be British. That was my expectation. And mine. Because I always had this sort of idea that these were just, you know, hearts of oak, as it were, um, British crewmen. If these men weren't British, where did they come from? And what were they doing on this quintessentially English warship? The analysis of the teeth rules out Britain and countries in Northern Europe. It suggests that the men grew up in a warmer climate, probably somewhere in southern Europe. It's also known that at this time, Henry VIII was short of skilled soldiers and sailors and was trying to recruit mercenaries from the continent. In Henry's state papers, there's one account in particular that appears to fit the evidence. Six months before the Mary Rose sank, nine ships were caught in a storm in the English Channel. They sought refuge in Falmouth Harbour in Cornwall. And on board were 600 Spanish soldiers. Starving and out of money, they were pressed into service for England. It's possible that some of these men were on the Merry Rose. The discovery that up to 60% of the crew came from overseas offers a new explanation of why she sank. I have the knaves I cannot rule. Yes. Yeah. That strange remark made by the captain yeah. just before the sinking. I mean, it really does, for me, it, it just conjured up a picture of a, of a zoo, really, of languages, you know. Well, you certainly wonder that if the boat did start heating over and water started coming in, your chances of being able to do anything to rectify that, if actually you can't even communicate properly with your crew because 60% of them don't speak fluent English, potentially. I think it's a recipe for disaster. We may never know exactly what happened below decks as the Mary Rose sank. But the bones reveal a hidden story about her crew. The men who died here on that summer's day in 1545 were a mix of sailors from Britain and men far from home. The sight of those trapped skeletons left an enduring impression on me. How many of those men from southern climes can have imagined they would end their days on a warship, fighting and dying for the King of England.